This is episode 108 of the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I'm Carly Cade, and today I'm speaking with Noche Miller. Noche has been riding horses since before she could walk. Dabbling in every sort of horse activity she could find, she was happy doing anything as long as it involved horses. After graduating, Noche loaded up her horse and moved out west, where she spent time doing ranch work. During this time, she started taking in young horses to train. Already a student of whorl theory, she paid attention to the whorls on horses who came in for training. The ones who were easy to start, as well as the tough ones. She added her own notes to the backs of books about whorls and continued her studies. Now a wife and mother, settled down on the farm, Noche spends more time leading children around on horses than riding herself. She has switched from taking in outside horses to training her own small herd of problem horses to do tricks. She still loves looking at whorls and can reach far more horses virtually than she was ever able to in person. With the expansion of her whorl studies to the internet came her book, Understanding Horse Whorls. In her spare time, after writing and caring for children and cattle, Noche is an instructor with the Horse Tricks Club, a reward-based online trick training course. She gets to work with people from all over the world, helping them learn how to teach tricks and build better relationships with their horses. Settle up for a conversation on understanding horse whorls and the benefits of trick training. Now, let's get into the interview. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast a podcast featuring interviews with equestrian authors who love all things horses and writing about them. In each episode, you'll hear inspirational stories from horse book authors, including writing advice and marketing tips to help you write your very own horse book. If you're an author, aspire to be an author, or simply love horse books, then you are in the right place. I'm your host, Carly Cade, and creative writing makes my spurs jingle. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I'm Carly Cade, and today I am very excited to introduce you to Noche Miller. Welcome to the show, Noche. Thank you for having me here. Oh my gosh, this is going to be a great episode. Noche is a whirl expert, which we're going to be getting (laughs) into and talking deeply. I sent her a couple pictures of my horses, and she's going to share a little information with us about what she saw in their whirls. I'm very excited about this episode. But as People who listen to the show know, or if you're new, welcome. How I always like to start the interviews off is, how have horses touched your life, Noche? Talk to us a little bit about that. There's no way horses haven't touched my life. We've had horses since before I was born. When I was a tiny baby, my mom would take the car seat out to the barn with her, set the car seat on the roof of the car, go and get on her horse bareback. We didn't have saddles until high school. Come over to the car, pick me up, and go ride. So... We grew up riding. We always had horses. My mom got a great big five-year-old Morgan Gilding when I was four. So my quiet old horse was no longer fun and exciting. All I wanted to do was ride her horse. (laughs) And she says I didn't fall off every time I rode him, but all I remember is falling off. (laughs) So through high school, I tried a little bit of everything to do with horses. We mostly trail rode our own horses. We did those little local horse shows. Mm-hmm. We were always the ones who obviously didn't have professional help. <laughs> it was <laughs> not a very good job, but it was fun. In high school, I worked at a hunter jumper barn and got to do a very little bit of jumping. They would never give me lessons because I rode Western. I was like, but I want to learn to ride English. <laughs> Please give me lessons. And they're like, oh, well, I don't have any horses that go Western. And so I got just a tiny little bit of jumping experience. And then I found a barn just down the road from our barn where I could go take dressage lessons. Mm. Unfortunately, the first thing she did was give me a pair of draw reins and say, here, go get your horse's head down. So luckily that didn't last very long. <laughs> did a lot of team pinning through high school. I spent my Friday nights team pinning with my dad. Then when I graduated, my brother and I packed up and headed out to Western Nebraska I got a job at Fort Robinson, which one of your, I just recently saw one of your guests talk about getting horses from. Mm-hmm. And I took my little Morgan Gilding out there only to discover that his grandsire, I think it was, had stood there as a stud back when they still had remount horses. So that was really cool. After working there for a couple of years, I just stayed here. <laughs> and I got a job on a ranch and did 
you know, ranch work, mm -hmm. which is a lot of fun and a lot of work. And I got a nice little gated Morgan mare that I showed in ranch horse competitions, got a couple buckles on her. She was really good. And then eventually I met my husband mm -hmm. and got married and moved from ranching to farming. And it was in 2015. My son, our youngest was not quite a year old. I was stuck at home with babies mm -hmm. and I was born sick. I had a couple of older, really, really good horses that were perfect for us and they didn't need any training and they were boring. <laughs> and I was complaining to my mom about being bored one time. And she's like, well, I wasn't going to tell you this, but Forever Morgans, a rescue that rescues Morgans, they are breed specific, had a three-year-old Morgan gilding that they needed a home for that day. And if they couldn't find anyone to foster him, he was going to ship. So I said I would take him. Oh and that gosh. was a huge turning point in my life. He came with a warning that he would run people over. And I was like, I've trained horses my whole life. I can deal with that. No big deal. When he finally got here, it was a big deal. It was a really big deal. He really ran people over. There was no stopping him from running you over. And he bit. Walking next to you, he would reach over and bite. And you couldn't lead him. He would bounce off the end of the lead rope. I'd come back from trying to take him for walks with blisters all over my hands because I just wow. couldn't do it. So... Finally, I, I was reading a blog and the lady talked about teaching her horse fetch. I thought, well, I can teach fetch. He bites everything anyway. <laughs> so we might as well put it to good use. And I found the Horse Tricks Academy and never looked back. <laughs> everything that I'm doing nowadays leads back to me getting rusty and him being uncontrollable and us starting trick training. I hear that yes. he was a giant handful, but it sounds like you've it led you in a certain direction from what I already know about you, but that's going to unfold as we talk, but you are in a great place with him now, right? You, the trick training helped get him where you can be partners or talk a little bit about the relationship you've been able to build with him. Yes. He's now the perfect horse. He's my man. He's, I love him dearly. He went from being dangerous to stand next to, to being the one that my little kids can handle safely and without me worrying at all. Mm -hmm. He's, we work at Liberty most of the time. I hardly ever have a halter on him. I, I you kind of forget how to use a halter. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a big change in life, but yeah, by teaching tricks, by feeding him treats, mm -hmm. training with treats, I taught him not to bite. Mm -hmm. And by rewarding him when he was good, when he did what I wanted him to do, instead of trying to punish him when he did what I didn't want it, he started trying desperately to please. He works really, really hard to do the right thing. He worries about it a lot. When he's not sure he's got it right, he gets really upset. He starts breathing really hard. <laughs> and he's just he's so cute. He does a lot of tricks. He can rope, like he can rope. He can take the rope and put it over a roping dummy. He helps me with laundry, which my family doesn't really appreciate, but he can pick clothes up out of the basket and hand them to me. Oh, he does all kinds of more normal tricks. He loves to play fetch. He can kiss, hug, smile, oh. basic stuff, Spanish walk. He can do anything. He's really a wonderful horse. That's incredible. Like the, the, you, the right horse came to the right person and, and you identified ways to, to, to help him because obviously something happened, right? And he developed these behaviors. Yes. And it's terrible. like that magic moment, just that one day he was there and available. You were bored. You talk to your mom and he, he came to you and you're like, oh no, what did I do? But instead of being like, oh no, what did I do? You're like, what do I do? And you search for a way to, that you could work together. And I knew there was that, that he's the best horse in the background after you finished that last story. Yes. So I think at this point in the uh, interview, it might be important for, before we get into your book and the whole conversation of horse goals, I feel like this should be a two-parter because we could talk about horse tricks 101 and we could talk about all this knowledge you have around horse rolls, but I know the what's next question is, is at the end usually because you've written a book, what's next, but do you want to talk a little bit about what you're thinking about doing given all the knowledge you have around this first trick training? Well, with trick training, I am an instructor. I started out, I found Horse Tricks Academy, Horse Tricks 101, looking for help with Rusty mm -hmm. and we got really involved in it and Jane, my boss, asked me if I'd like to help teaching more lessons. So me and another lady in a key, they're both in Australia. I've never met them in person. I don't know that I've even talked to them like we are here. So two of my best friends I've never met. It's 
It's really fun. They're great fun to work with. And so we teach tricks with the Horse Tricks Academy. We do video and written lessons that people can watch. And then we have a Facebook page where people can post their own horses, what they're doing, any problems they're having, and we help them with it. We have members from all over the world. I've got good friends in England and Canada and Australia and mostly English speaking countries because we speak English. It makes it easier. (laughs) But there's also some people from non-English speaking countries. We have France and the Netherlands and it's a lot of fun. And I really believe that teaching tricks can solve almost every problem people have with horses. By not working directly on the problem, we take a lot of the pressure off. Mm. It's taking a few steps back and solving the problem before you get to the problem itself. And that lets us fix the problem without ever having to work on that exact problem. That's awesome. And then where where uh, do listeners find that Facebook page where they can go and see what people are posting on the Horse Trick Facebook page? Well, we have a, a private members page. Oh, this just for the members, but we also have Horse Tricks 101 on Facebook and horsetricks101.com if you don't do Facebook. But we post a lot of our members' accomplishments on there so everybody can see, so we can show off how great they are. So we have a lot of really, really good members who do a lot of fun stuff with their horses. That's so cool. I'm inspired. I would love to do more tricks with my horses, but it's nice to know that there's a resource. I'll make sure to link to those places in the show notes so people who are interested in seeing your work in that area can go directly to. Now, I'm, I'm so excited to talk to you because you, you've kind of lived a life that I would have loved to live, like working on a ranch, growing up with horses. Like now you're doing this space where you're working with horses and they're, uh, you're working the horse tricks, but you have this incredible wealth of knowledge around whirls, whirls on a bunch of animals, but you focus on horses. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about your book and what inspired you to write about horses and their whirls? And maybe probably for those of us, I imagine the horse people listening will know what a whirl is, but some other people may not. So maybe we should define the whirl first. <laughs> a lot of people don't know what whirls are. I mean, who pays attention to these things? Mm. It's just the way the hair grows. It doesn't seem like a big deal. But a whirl is also, you know, called cowlicks, swirls, whatever. All horses have one in the middle of the forehead and the flanks and the front of the chest. But the whirls develop early on in um, gestation while the foal is still a fetus. The brain is developing and the muscles are developing. And there's different theories as to what causes the whirls, but it's thought to be pressure on the skin layer or extra blood flow. But whatever it is, it's because something is happening in that area. Hmm. And so when there's extra development in an area, I mean, something's going on, obviously. And that causes the world to grow, to develop in that spot. So it's not just a mark in the hair. It goes deeper. It's deeply connected with the brain and the muscle. And as long as people have had horses, they've been noticing the whirls. There's all kinds of old wives' tales, lore passed down from gypsies, cowboys, everybody who's had horses. And the really fun thing is that they usually match up from different parts of the world. People have looked at their horses. They're like, oh, it has this whirl on the forehead. And every horse I've had with this whirl on the forehead has acted like this. I mean, it's hard not to notice those things. So they pass it down and that's the basis of this. So it started out being people noticing how horses acted and developing superstitions, if you will, stories to go with it. But nowadays we know how a world develops. You know, we can see what's happening in the womb. We can see there's been studies that have shown distinct correlation between worlds and genetics. Mm -hmm. So now that now we can take modern science and see how that applies to the old wives tales and that there's reason for this. It's not just that someone made stuff up. It's that we were being observant and knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. So just because we didn't have a name for something before, doesn't mean it doesn't, didn't exist before. I mean, before we named gravity, there was still gravity. Mm -hmm. So now we know the how and why of worlds, not just the what. Oh, that is so neat. And it's, it's kind of like storytelling. I, you know, now there's the science to back it up, but storytelling was what kept primitive people alive. Like that berry made me very sick or killed so-and-so this berry is good you can eat it it's like the passing the stories in the world is the same like the real horsemen or people that were trying to understand their horses kind of pass on this knowledge through stories of the worlds and now there's the data to back it up which is so cool 
Now, you've written an in-depth book about horse worlds and what they mean. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your book and what inspired you to take that on? Well, I always thought I would write a romance. <laughs> it's what I like to read. And I've always had a plot line going in my head my whole life, you know, mm-hmm. adding to it as I'm bored or something. So I, <laughs> I never thought to write anything real. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but my boss, Jane, she was like, hey, will you write us some content for the Facebook page? G- give me a, qu- a little article about worlds. And maybe if you wouldn't mind writing a short book that we can give away as a freebie when we're s- selling stuff. And I was like, oh yeah, no problem. I, I can do that. And I sat down like a day and got both of those done. And then she's like, well, you know, you could write a longer book if you wanted. I mean, that might be fun. And it's like, oh, wow. <laughs> well, that would be fun. I could do that. And I've read everything out there to read about worlds. Linda Tellington Jones has a great book from back in the 90s, I believe it was, about worlds. And I've read that. And I didn't want to be anything like that mm. because she already covered that. And it was great. It it's, covers everything in great detail. It's, it's a good book. So I wanted to not be that book. So one of the things that I'm really interested in that most things don't cover is worlds across the body. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows that worlds on, most people know, the worlds on the head tell us about temperament. But if we look at the worlds on the body, we can see how the horse will move, and how the confirmation is. So I decided to delve deeper into that and to look into the science behind why we can see worlds and what they do. And that quick little book turned into a huge undertaking, but finally got it done. And it's been a lot of fun. And I've learned so much over these last few years beyond what I even thought I knew before that. And still learning, constantly learning. Now tell tell the listeners what the name of the book is in full because we've mentioned it a couple times but we haven't said the actual title and I think you've got it there so you can hold I it up for do. us. I, I have one back there but I also have one here. Excellent. Well Understanding prepared. horse whirls and this is my horse on the cover. This is Rusty, my trouble causer. He is a high double whirl which can lead to trouble causers but it can also lead to great wonderful horses who can do anything if you can get them to put their mind to it. Mm. So yes, Understanding Horse Whirls. Yeah. Check out her book and the websites and the Facebook page, the Facebook page, there's so much information. Like it, it blew my hair back. I mean, she knows what she's talking about. I sent her a couple pictures of Sissy and Tanner, my two, my two mares. And I, it, in just an email exchange, she blew my hair back with some information she shared about Sissy. And we're going to go over that a little bit here in a second, but what brought you to really wanting to dive into worlds like because I know you have you've had years and years and years of experience with horses like what what initially attracted you to being someone who knows so much about them well the first time I ever heard about worlds we were sitting up in Wisconsin at South Kettle Moraine I think it is by Palmyra we held the horses up there for the weekend trail riding and we're sitting around the campfire reading I think it was horse and rider and it was an article about worlds and it said stacked double whirls are crazy basically and we looked over and one of the horses was tied to the trailer with one of those bungee lead ropes the kind Mm -hmm. that are elastic and he would pull his head out as far as the rope would go and let it slam back against the trailer over and over again we're like oh well (laughs) there's something to might just be true (laughs) but then my mom got me Linda Tellington Jones's book and I was starting Colts at the time and I read the book very carefully it was fascinating And then I looked at the horses I was riding and the one who really did it for me, one of the ones, there were a few of them, was a little Arab cross. He was very well bred for reining. Um, He was, he belonged to the trainer that I was riding with at the time, getting lessons from, and he sent him down for some riding. And his flank whirls, one of them wrapped like clear up over the back, almost to the top line. And the other one only came part way up his side. (laughs) And they called him wingnut because he was slightly crazy. He would be going along and just bolt for no reason. And there was obviously something going on with him. Um, Looking back now, uneven flank whirls will lead to the hips being uneven, the body not feeling right to the horse. You know, if you're walking on very uneven shoes, your ankles slip a little, you're you're kind of nervous. Mm -hmm. So the horse feels nervous because their body isn't balanced and it leads to things like bolting and spookiness. Um, So- Looking at the horses that I was riding and looking at the whirls, there was the correlation was obvious. You couldn't miss it. And there were a lot that I didn't see in the books available at the time. So I had my book there and I took notes in the back of it. 
yeah, just paid attention because it was fun because it's horses. Who doesn't want to learn everything they can about horses? Absolutely. So I imagine being educated about horse worlds would be a very important thing if you were looking to buy a new horse, uh, bring, adopt a horse, breed your horse. These are things that, that can be indicators for the health, the, the sound mindedness, all of these things of a horse. So I, I imagine, is that right? Like what you've, what you've educated people on in your book can help them when they're going to choose a horse that will fit their personality and their budget because of worlds. Is that right? I sure think so. I mean, if you're going for an upper level dressage horse and you get a horse whose whirls aren't even on both sides of the body, say the flank whirls like that Arab, mm -hmm. it's not going to work. Not easily for sure. Probably not show winningly good. I know a lady, I talked to one lady who bought a horse. All horses have whirls on the underside of their belly, you know, down under the flanks on either side of the belly, the belly button. Mm -hmm. They have whirls there. And this horse was missing one. And he would, when he walked, his hind leg on that side would like swing clear forward uncontrollably. He didn't move evenly. He was very, very spooky. He would bolt. Um, she stuck with him. She did great by him. But how many people are willing to do that? And if you're looking for a horse that you want to show and have a good career with, he's never going to make a good show horse. He, she's doing really good with him. And on his great days, he's wonderful. There are no bad worlds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's my main theme with all of this is there are no bad worlds, just different ways that we need to work with horses. But depending on what we want to do with those horses, there may be some worlds that will make the horses not suitable for our goals mm -hmm. in life. And that's good to know rather than battling. I mean, there's an indicator. You can still go ahead and choose the horse if you have a connection in other yeah. ways, but it, it's like, totally. no, it's like knowing what they're capable of based on nature, right? This is a conversation about, about their nature and nature. Totally. I, I had one lady come to me on the Facebook page and say, I am so glad to know this. Her horse had big whirls in the throat latch area, which means they're not going to tuck their head down. They're not going to go to or behind vertical. They're going to want to carry their head forward. Mm -hmm. She's like, in all the lessons I take, my trainers are telling me to get this horse's head to vertical, bring his head down. And she's like, now that I know about the whirls, I know that we're fighting a losing battle. I know we're making my horse uncomfortable doing something he's not going to be able to do. I've realized I need to just tell my trainers, no, I can't do this and not try to make my horse do something he's not capable of. That's amazing. And that there is the love of an owner of a horse and the relationship coming together and how, and how much we have a shared compassion for each other, because she said no, rather than trying to force it, but she didn't know why it wasn't working until she educated herself a little further. I talk about education all the time on the on this show and it's not just about writing books, it's about understanding our animals, understanding each other, you know, trying to be the best human you can be for your partners, human or animals. And you mentioned too that worlds not only apply to horses, it matters with dogs and other animals too, is that right? Yes, everything with hair has a whirl. There's this wonderful, horrible thing called the hairy ball theorem, which <laughs> is scary. an awful name or a wonderful name because it's really boring, but the name is good. It basically says you can't comb the hair flat on a coconut without creating a whirl. <laughs> that if we have things that are curved round, you know, bodies, they're going to have a whirl. Everything with hair has a whirl. And we can learn about everything from those whirls. People have whirls on the back of our head. Some people have doubles. There's other things, though. We're not really allowed to judge, study people's worlds too much, profiling, all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> yeah. it's kind of frowned on, not politically correct. But there are things like a fawn's tail mm -hmm. in the lower back. People with spina bifida occulta will have a patch of hair on the lower part of their spine. And it's, it's the first thing doctors look for when babies are born one of the first things oh. to see if they have the problem. It's hair on the outside of a skin that tells us about the inside. And to me, that's just more proof that this is obviously a thing. This really works. Some people don't believe it. They think it's superstition, that it's silly. So I was like, just go, go read the science. I mean, there's lots of stuff supporting this. It's not just old wives tales. I love that. I, thank you so much for sharing all that amazing information. And thank you for writing a book that takes it a step further and applies the science and, and furthers the conversation about understanding worlds. I think that was incredible. I mean, we just randomly like ran into each other. I think you sent me an, a message on Facebook that you enjoyed listening to the podcast and, and that you were also an author. And then I went and looked at your 
work. And I was like, oh my gosh, she has to come on and, and talk about horse worlds with us. So thank you for coming on the show. Like, where did you find your research for your book? Like you, you had a lot of knowledge yourself. You've heard the old wives tales. Like where did you, and you read, read all the books there were, did you have to do any additional crazy research to, to get the scientific information to pull together? I have spent hours, days, Googling, searching, finding studies. There's lots of studies out there on this, finding and trying to read the scientific jargon without Mm -hmm. making my eyes cross and my brain go blank. And then trying to distill that down into simple, easy to understand. Because anybody can go try to read the studies that are out there. (laughs) But reading and understanding are two different things. And I have a lot of really good friends who have helped me with their experience with horses. I've got a friend, Ari in Nevada, more friends I've never met in person. And she is a great trainer. And she, she texted me one day and she's like, I've got these horses and I've been looking under their stomachs. And she noticed that those two whirls on the bottom of their stomach, when the, when they don't match up, the horses move differently. So if one whirl is further forward, the horse will step further under their, under themselves with that leg. If they're out to the outside, the horses will step further out with that leg. And I never would have noticed that. I got to admit, I've never looked, I don't spend a lot of time looking under my horse's stomachs and I'm not a good enough student of horse movement to notice that and see all the correlation. So hearing her sharing her knowledge was just amazing. I've got another friend who is on the complete opposite end of the spectrum who lives close to her in Utah and she works on a ranch. She's the cowgirl. I never will be. I live vicariously through her, but she <laughs> spends a lot of time on her horses, a lot of time riding her horses and studying their worlds. So we get together and discuss worlds. And a lot of it is word of mouth, friends sharing stories. I mean, how are we going to learn if it's not by seeing our horses, how they act and move and making note of it? Mm -hmm. So other than studying and Googling and reading everything out there, it's lots and lots of time spent talking to people, seeing what their horses are like and sharing information. But learning from other people is invaluable. For example, today, a lady posted a picture of her foal on the Facebook page and he's somewhere under a year. I don't know. And he's got a whirl down the very bottom of his nose between the eyes and the nose. And that's really unusual. I was like, I was looking at it, trying to think what it could be. I have no idea. I'm never ashamed to admit that I don't know. Mm. I mean, there's always so much more out there to learn. I spend a lot of time saying, I, I don't know. So I was reading through the comments to see what anybody else had to say. And another lady said, oh, well, all foals have that. And well, I don't think that all foals have that because I've had a few. And I mean, I've never noticed it. Surely I would have noticed that. But she put, put up pictures of every foal in her herd. And they all had that big open whirl down the front of their nose. It's like, Well, that's interesting. So there's always new things to find out about and learn. So hopefully more people will share pictures of their foals. Whirls show, whirls can develop after horses are born because there's something going on under the skin. I've seen a dog who developed a big whirl on his shoulder where he had a tumor and cancer. And it was a very sad um, story that lady posted. But so whirls can develop later in life and they show something going on under the skin. So my working theory at the moment is that maybe it has something to do with teeth coming in. Hmm. As the foals get their teeth and they're growing, that whirl is show is growing there to show something going on. And then it disappears later in life. This lady who had a whole bunch of horses with it, her grown up horses don't have it anymore. She said it just, it's there with the first foal coat. Wow. I just, I love all these new things that turn up and they're common to some people who don't even think it's unusual. And I've never seen it before. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Isn't it great? The kind of information we can now share given the access we have to people in other places and the internet, you know, it can be a time suck, but there's also a lot of valuable information sharing. What I'm hearing is we need to be paying more attention to worlds. When I sent you the pictures of my horses, I just sent you pictures of their head. And my knowledge of worlds is pretty much the one in the middle of their forehead. But as you're sharing all these stories, I'm learning so much more about how worlds impact the horse on other parts of the body, which is so exciting to know that there's there's people studying this so you can learn more about them. So Pay attention to worlds, listeners, right? <laughs> yes, they're, they're such a little thing, but amazingly important. Fascinating. So, and I definitely want to mention this uh, because 
you offer a service of custom world analysis on your website. Can you talk a little bit about how someone would and what, what that entails? What's a custom world analysis? It's just so cool. <laughs> I think it's important, just as important as a pre-purchase exam. I mean, we wouldn't get a horse without knowing they're healthy just because we like the horse doesn't always mean it's going to be the best fit or best able to do what we are looking for them to do. Mm -hmm. So on my Facebook page, people post horses and we talk about their worlds all the time. I mean, that's free and available and anyone can do it. I don't always go into great detail with everything. There's a lot of horses that get posted there. I can only do so much. Mm -hmm. I still have all my other work that needs done. So if someone did want a full analysis of every world on the horse's body, talked about exactly what it means, the why and how of it. Yes, I do a full body, full horse analysis. Look at all the worlds everywhere and tell you exactly what, instead of just a brief going over like we do on the Facebook page. That's amazing. I, I love that you offer that service. Now, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the pictures I sent you of just my horse's head? So I don't, I don't get the full body analysis, but what I understand you did before our conversation started is you did a write-up on both both my horses with the pictures there and I'll put the pictures uh, in the show notes so people can go and, and check those out if you're not watching us on YouTube. But did you want to talk a little bit about what you discovered in Sissy and Tanner's? Which one do you want to start with? Oh, uh, let's do Sissy since, since she's, okay. she, she's the elder and the uh, she's definitely the alpha. <laughs> yes. And I've had, I've had Sissy before, not her, but a horse with this exact head type. Oh, so wow. it's always fun to see the the correlation and how they're all so much alike. I mean, this is a type. It's not just her whirl. It's, mm -hmm. it's there's a head type that shows a very definite set of things about the horse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, and it, this is interesting too, because you study not just whirls, but also the shape of the head and mm -hmm. other indicators on the body. So that's part of your custom whirl analysis, right? Like you actually look at the shape of yes. the head and yeah. That would be very important to mention. The worlds are only a small part as much as we can learn from them. We can look at the shape of the head, the ears, the eyes, the nose, and all of that gives us a big piece of what the horse is going to be like. There's definite types and temperaments that go with different head shapes. So Sissy has a very simple whirl. It's a single center whirl. According to the old lore, it says that a single whirl will not will tell show us a steady quiet dependable horse and then people get a horse with a single world that isn't and they're like oh well worlds don't work but really what a single center world shows us is that we can't see anything about the horse based on the world no extremes the world is very, very center and basic and we have to look at the head to learn anything about them so she's got the center world and her profile the shape of her head in the front from the side is mostly straight, which shows a steady, dependable horse, but it has a hint of a dish to it for some sensitivity. The more dished, the more sensitive. Her chin is the interesting thing about her. We can just barely see it in this picture, but we can see plenty to know what the chin type is. It's flat until we get to the big point at the back, and that comes to a very sharp point. So when she gets upset, she's going to tighten her lower lip and flatten that lip out like a child pouting <laughs> and the chin itself the point will get rock hard and just so much tension in her it's a good way to tell when they're upset and that we need to back off in the training or get away from what's scaring them but the interesting thing about that chin type is it doesn't just show temperament it shows a horse who will have very fine sensitive skin bug bites drive them crazy the one i had the two that I have and had are covered in hives all summer from bug bites. The skin is very wrinkly. When they pull their nostrils back, like in disgust, which they tend to do, it gets all wrinkled up around them and they show disgust a lot, don't they? Mm -hmm. I see you nodding there. <laughs> <laughs> this could not be more accurate. I that This is what blew my hair back when you started talking about this. Please continue. <laughs> I'm so fascinated. The skin around the eyes. I know the one I've had when she's upset, the skin pulls clear down so you can see the pink around the eyeball. And when you're scratching a really good spot, it'll pull clear down around the eyeball and you can see the skin there. So we have a steady, dependable horse who's also very sensitive and lets you know when she's upset. My my heart is melting because you you pretty much identified her. The bugs drive her crazy for sure, but she's she is very expressive through her chin and her and her eyes. And I know when she's frustrated. Like 
it's not so much training related. I mean, we're, we're past the point where we're showing and training really hard all the time. Now we're just really enjoying each other, but she expresses like when she's annoyed right through her chin and, and, and then the good spot when I'm scratching her. So yeah, she's incredibly dependable, but, but very sensitive and very uh, in tune. She's, she's smart. She's like, I feel very connected with her. Um, and she's very emotional. She expresses herself and I know what she means. It's just incredible information. <laughs> yeah. The mare we have right now, that's my son's horse. She has that chin too. Mm -hmm. And it's just, the similarities are amazing. It's so much fun to see. Oh, and it's so neat that you can see this and, sh and share this with people through your analysis. It's amazing. Okay. Now, Tanner, I don't know as much about personally why, personality wise. I'm still learning her. It took her a long time to warm up to me, but we're finally really, really starting to bond, but she's a bit of a, I'm just curious to hear what, what you have to say, looking at, at Tanner, because I'm not as familiar with her as I am with Sissy yet. <laughs> I think she has a little bit less going on than Sissy. I mean, just a little more easy going in there. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Tanner has a slightly high whirl, which means that it's just above eye level, you know, center is between the eyes. So this one is just above, which will make her an extrovert. Extroverts are very invested in the external world, everything around them. They, they are aware of everything. They notice everything. They're extroverts. Smart, emotional, sensitive. If you get after them too hard, most extroverts, there's right brain and left brain extroverts. So we need to, extroverts in general, if you get after them too hard, don't take it well. Mm -hmm. They will like, spook explode be terrified of everything but if you provide them with support if you don't try to force them at things that they're scared at if instead you say it's okay i understand we'll work through this they will be as brave as they ever possibly can they'll try their hearts out for you you're so <laughs> this is so accurate it's like blowing my mind that is a hundred percent her continue and then we'll talk more about it <laughs> i'm so impressed this is great um, but coming up from that world there's some feathering feathering is when the hair grows out from a center line you know like a feather if you picture a bird feather coming up from the world mm -hmm. that's what feathering is that generally shows left brain traits left brain and people horses is all the same it's it analyzes, it thinks, it's where people process math and speech and that kind of stuff. Right brain is emotion mm -hmm. and reaction. So feathering shows left brain qualities, usually calm, curious, friendly. And a left brain extrovert is a lot different than a right brain extrovert. So she's going to lean more towards the left brain side. And her, for, her profile supports that. It's very straight, which steady, dependable. The muzzle squares off. You know, it doesn't round, it doesn't slope. It's it's very square above the nostrils. Um, that shows steady, dependable, willing. They want to get along. Just, you know, a nice little horse. <laughs> that is so correct. Particularly the, the left brain, like she's always more like checking things out and what's going on and the getting after part. Is she's very aware of her external environment. Like the first time I took her on a trail ride, she's, I had no idea this horse was afraid of bikes because I got her later in life. A mountain bike came up and she was like, oh no, she like spun on her hind leg. With, thank, thank heaven I held on, but she spun and she wanted to take off. And I didn't get mad at her. My friend like kind of cut off the mountain bike and said, just wait for a second. So we've been working ever since I got her on just introducing her to mountain bikes and getting her comfortable with it. And she's slowly coming around, but if, if I get after her too much, she's just not having it. It's so funny. It's so true. So I'm just very patient with her, but she's lovely and dependable and a, and a lovely horse, but Sissy's definitely emotional and she's definitely like just sort of calm and like, doesn't want to, like, she just doesn't have the same sort of expressiveness, but she's just really a nice horse. Like you said, it's just kind of nice to get validation on how you're experiencing your horse too, through the markings they have. So I can't imagine what it'd be like to actually pick one out and check all their markings and whirls and then see what package you wind up with, you know, because this, this is by accident. <laughs> on that note, the whirls on the head aren't always everything. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not always right. There's always things we don't know about. There's training, there's life experiences, there's the whirls across the body. So the whirls on the head can be very simple and straightforward, but then the whirls on the body can 
cause them to behave in a way mm -hmm. that my friend that uh, ranches out in Utah, she had a beautiful little bay horse that she was riding. He was a ranch horse, not hers. And she was getting along pretty good with him. He wanted to be steady, dependable, and well-behaved. But she had to lend him to somebody else to ride when they were out moving cows one time. And that guy was not a good rider and he couldn't handle the horse and the horse bucked a little bit with him. Mm -hmm. So one of the cowboys on the place got on this horse and fixed the problem for her. He bucked him out and, and he came back in pretty rough shape and terrified of people, but his whirls caused his body to be unbalanced, but they caused him to like curve to the left. He could not go to the right comfortably. So even though his head showed a quiet, well-behaved horse, his body caused him to be uncomfortable, which caused him to buck. And then with the bad handling on top of that, he was a problem. She had him straightened out. And I bought my last horse based on whirls. Like, oh, no problem. I don't have to see him. I, I train and with that and whirls, I'm pretty uncomfortable buying horses that I don't see in person. Mm -hmm. So I got this horse, I got him home and we just didn't work. We weren't working. We still aren't working. We're getting better. But he had one whirl high and two hour right facing him and another spot in the hair that was always there. It just never went away. And for the longest time, I thought, well, he's only got one whirl. But then finally, I realized this other spot is a whirl and I had no explanation for it. It wasn't one I'd ever seen before. And talking to people, which is the greatest way to learn new <laughs> information, I came across a couple other horses who had this world who acted just like him. So I had bought this horse thinking that his world was one way and then got him home, learned more, looked closer because worlds can be amazingly hard to see. I swear sometimes they hide <laughs> and realized that I had bought a horse that was completely different world type than I expected. And we're working through it slowly, but surely as I have time, it's never easy. <laughs> Yeah, it's that's so fascinating. I mean, I can totally see how whirl like the story you shared about the, the horse that had the whirl up high in its rump and then the short whirl on the other side. I can see that almost it like screams in balance. But if you're not trained to look for it, how would you know? Thank you so much for looking at pictures of Sissy and Tanner and sharing that information. I thought that was so generous of you. Thank you. Now I'm realizing I should have taken a picture of my horses from every angle and 360'd it for you, but just that little bit you shared was so informative. Now, with your book, getting back to your book about worlds <laughs> that I am immediately going to go out and get because I want that on my bookshelf and I want to dive deeper into this. But how, talk, talk to us about a little bit, let's get a little bit to the publishing side of things. Like, how did you uh, go about publishing this? Did you decide to go the independent route, take care of it yourself, or did you work with a publisher to, to put the book out? How did you do this? I went independent. I published through Amazon mm -hmm. because it was simple and easy. Mm -hmm. I've heard all this horror stories about people shopping around for publishers and all the difficulty and troubles there. And I have a good enough base to advertise to mm -hmm. that I felt comfortable getting it out there on my own, finding people who were interested in buying it. Obviously it's working. You're reaching people through Amazon. So, so you, so you kind of handle everything yourself and you have a say of how it's going and, and you're making a little yeah. extra cash and it's, it's, so it's only available on Amazon or, or through you on your website. Is that right? Yes, that is. It's only available on Amazon, but who doesn't have Amazon anyway already? Well, and someday so. you can expand it out. I, you know, I'm, I, you know, there's a, that's the great thing about being an indie author is that you can always add another wad to your giant chewed gumball that's how I like to call it. You start off with one piece of gum and then there's like a thousand on there. You can always add more and expand it as you find time or, or, or that something calls you forward to have to do it or you want to be able to reach a wider audience. So you always have that ability to do that with your own work. You own your intellectual property. So that's brilliant. Yes, I do. I'm in control of it. And there's always going to be more to add. I had to just find a stopping spot and quit there. So as life goes on, I learn more things. I figure out what's up with the worlds on the foals' noses, things like that. I can add it to it. And who knows, maybe someday I'll decide to publish differently, have the time to put, put into it. Mm -hmm. But for now, it really is just working nice going through Amazon. I haven't had any trouble. Mm -hmm. It's it's just easy. Well, it sounds like you made a smart choice. You, you said, I want to put this book out. I have only this much time. I have a lot of other responsibilities and things that I need to be doing. This works for me. And, you know, sometimes we get going where we want to do too much and then we're overwhelmed and it's not fun anymore. It's not about what you started writing 
for, which was to educate people and share your knowledge. What has for you been the hardest part about being an author and getting words on the page? And then what's been the best part about this process for you? Time. It's always so hard to find the time. I've got small children and we farm. I've got the cows and all that stuff to do. I've got my job with the academy and it all takes so much time and there's only so much time. And I want to ride my horses once in a while. Yeah. So there is that. And it's hard to convince people I'm actually working. My kids are like, oh, mom sits on Facebook all day. Like, well, yeah, that's partially true, but I really am working. I have to do this. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a little bit difficult, but it's a problem I'll take because I also get to be home Mm -hmm. to take care of the animals, do all the things, ride my horses. I can do things with the kids, take them to school, do classes, whatever they need anytime, because I am, I work from home. I don't have a real job and I just love getting to learn more about horses. Mm -hmm. I think that's awesome. And I would argue that you have a more real job than most real jobs because you're actually doing something that you like and you want to do and you have flexibility. I think that's the future of having a real job. A real job is something we actually love to do, not have to do. So I think, I think things are, I think you're doing, doing everything right. If, if you had any advice that you would give yourself before you published this book, what would it be? Well, take better notes. I wish I'd written more about the horses when I was training in the back of my other, my other world book. Mm -hmm. I thought I made notes and I went back and look, I'm like, oh, (laughs) this, this doesn't help me at all. What in the world? What was exactly how did he move? Exactly. What was the effect of this world? (sighs) Put more time and effort into studying publishing. I I'm happy with Amazon, but I wish that I understood more how to do the other and was willing to put the effort in studying English. (laughs) <laughs> was kind of a big thing for me. I was horrible at English in school and never had any interest in that. So learning that sort of thing is kind of important. Save your editor, proofreader, a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Know your yours and theirs. <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting. I think being an author and a writer, and I imagine you're a reader too, when you have time, I, it's once you've written a book, you read differently. It's like you start seeing the language. You're not just blasting through it. You're like, oh, okay. Yeah. Comma, you know, and like how everything goes. See, that's the cool thing about all this stuff. There's always room to grow and add on with horses, with studying, with educating yourself, with being an author. It's like, as long as it's fun, there's more to add. So I wanted to ask you really quick too, because I know a lot of people are going to be really interested in picking up this book and learning more about worlds and their horses and behavior. How do you have your book set up. I mean, thank you. Thank you for distilling all those scientific papers so they can make sense for us <laughs> to read the books. But like, how did you kind of set it up? Like I, I, I looked at your Amazon page. I understand there's pictures so people can see pictures of what's going on that you're talking about, but did you go through the history and then do some analysis or how, how did you kind of set your book up? Well, I started out with the why and how, how worlds develop, what the studies are that show how they, how they work and how they correlate. And then went into the different world types. So we covered the head Mm -hmm. and then the body and then things like the mane, what side the mane grows on can tell us things about the horse. Um, There's crushed velvet, which covers the whole body Mm -hmm. and can show tension in the fascia, fascia, you know, under the skin. So go through that and cover all the worlds individually. And then in the end, there's horses, stories about individual horses, complete analysis of what I can see of their worlds and what they're like in their stories. So start with a fact and end with stories. And so it is storytelling. I'm still, I don't know. Yeah, totally. I love this. You're a great storyteller. I love all the stories that you've shared in, in this conversation too. So guys, this is like the perfect way to get your head wrapped around worlds, not just on the forehead, but on the entire body and, and their stories and examples. So this is, this is great. And I know at the beginning of our conversation, I asked you what you're curious about and what's next. Uh, is there anything you want to add? Is there another book in the, in the, what about that romance story you want to write? Thinking about sitting down and getting back at that? <laughs> Maybe someday when the kids are grown up and gone and I'm retired, I can finally get a couple of the romances out of my head. <laughs> I would like to eventually write a, a book that covers the legends more. Oh, cool. I love the legends and the superstitions and I'd love to cover them and then go into what could have caused superstitions. Mm. There's worlds that are bad luck. 
And then if we look at it, we can see reasons why they would have been bad luck. Um, whirls on the cheek are supposed to be bad luck. They can show a horse who carries tension. And if the tension does, isn't released, they'll explode. And they can show teeth issues. So if you're depending on horses for your living, a horse who has teeth issues and is losing weight and will occasionally explode is pretty bad luck. Other than writing, I am working on getting together like an in, not in person, in person over the computer clinic presentation that people can get like for their 4-H club, barn group, riding group, and then get together and have an hour or two conversation just about whirls. So hopefully I'll get that done and that'll be fun. I, with the training, because I didn't have enough to do already, I'm, we're branching into training cattle. Oh, cool. <laughs> so my boss is training chickens. And because I have cattle, I brought a couple in and I'm working on training them to do tricks and maybe eventually ride. So cattle tricks 101 is up and coming. And that's been a lot of fun. <laughs> and not just tricks, but also people show cattle, or if you want to milk a cow or something, by teaching them tricks, mm -hmm. you can also train them to lead and to be milked and whatever very practical purposes there are. Yeah. But so one of my cows is learning to fetch <laughs> all sorts of fun things like that. I love this. I only imagine that teaching a horse tricks or anything tricks is just like a respect and a understanding and tapping into the, the brilliance of, of the animals. Actually, it's like a language without using language and really deepens your relationship. I, I, is that accurate? Oh, yes, completely. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful. The things that you end up being able to do with them and the complete lack of fear that it brings about in horses. Mm -hmm. And are you under the philosophy that it's never too late to teach an animal tricks, no matter what their age? Oh, goodness. Yes. Okay, good. The age doesn't matter at all. Okay, good. I wanted to clear that up because isn't there something you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Yeah, some sort they of, say that. Yeah, I don't think they're very good trainers. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay. So a, a horse at any age, listeners, as you're listening to this, can learn tricks. So if you're interested in that aspect of being with your horse and working with your horse, here's a resource for you to go try it out. I know I'm going to try some tricks. Sissy can bow and give hugs. Oh, um, wow. Nice. Yeah, yeah. She can bow and give hugs. Tanner's learning to give hugs, but I'd love to expand that and like, and have more fun playing rather than, you know, just got to work for a horse show all the time. So play, this sounds like a lot of fun for both horse and owner. <laughs> That, that would be a lot of fun. I have fantasies of going to a cutting or something, you know, getting down and doing a really good job and then Spanish walking out of the arena. Oh, that, that would be would incredible. Be. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, if you, your team really wanted to expand this, like I'm sure you could train horses for like TV and Hollywood and all that. I mean, they're probably always looking for people that have this sort of connection with horses, you know, that, so. would, be, that would be fun. Hey, always a possibility. No, Jay, I have so, so, so enjoyed talking to you today. Thank you for sharing so much really cool information with me. Uh, I know you've mentioned a couple of times some of the places people can reach you, but where can listeners find you and your books if they want more information? Well, the book is available on Amazon, but if you want to discuss worlds, uh, the Facebook page is very active. People post their own horses <laughs> and do analysis and we all talk about horses and whirls and that's equine swirls whirls study on facebook <laughs> horse whirl forum on facebook but that's where i post my own thoughts and articles about whirls so if you want to share your horse equine swirls whirl study is the place to go and there is horsewhirls.com which is my website and not a whole lot of new stuff there but you can read about personality types and basics about whirls. I do have a YouTube channel, which is Horse Whirls, again, where I go over my friend's horses and analyze their whirls and talk about them in person, where we can see them while we're talking about them. For tricks, I have Rescuing Rusty on Facebook, which is my horse, my trouble horse, who is now my perfect pony. And we do videos and talk about him and all my other horses. There's Cattle Tricks 101 on Facebook, Horse Tricks 101 on Facebook. We have a lot of stuff going. So there's a lot of pages. And I will link to all of Noche's amazing spaces where you can learn more and educate yourself. Noche, thank you so much for the gift of your time. Thank you for coming on the show today. Well, it's been my pleasure. You've been a lot of fun to talk to. I always enjoy listening to your podcast. Oh, and thank you for being a listener. It means so much. Authors unite. Let's take care of each other and learn from each other. And thanks for all the education and information you shared with us today. Well, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. 
Thanks for joining us this week on the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I hope you enjoy these Q&A sessions with wonderful equine authors who love all things horses and writing, just like me. Visit my website, carlycadecreative.com, where you can read the show notes, and make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you so much for your support. Want a free guide to secrets of horse book authors? Gallop over to carlycadecreative.com forward slash wisdom to have author advice delivered instantly to your inbox. If you are an author who writes about horses and would like to be spotlighted, please let me know. Visit my contact page at carlycadecreative.com to fill out a request. I'd be happy to have you on the show too. Thank you for tuning in to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. See you next time. I'm your host, Carly Cade. Creative writing makes my spurs jingle.